That has to be the dry run anthem right there. We'll sing that at Christmas. We'll sing that at uh, Halloween. We'll sing it any time of the year. We always love that song, don't we? And uh, I was on the back playing the drums on the wall back there right along with Jared. So I'm glad that you enjoy that uh, song of praise as well. Uh, I want to echo what uh, Alex said just a few minutes ago. Uh, if you are new to our congregation, today might be your first Sunday here. Or maybe you've been here for six months, maybe to a year, whatever it is, and uh, you haven't had a chance to be a part of our welcome class. I put this on a couple of times a year. We're going to have that in the classroom right across the hall in two weeks. It's just a real informal time. You get to meet some members of our congregation. Uh, we'll have some coffee and donuts together, and you'll learn a little bit more about our our church family. So I want to remind you that just a couple of weeks away, uh, December the 10th, I believe it is, uh, right across the hallway in the classroom 106. Christmas is almost here, right? And Christmas is a time for questions. It's a time for qu questions. Uh, I mean, uh, Santa Claus will ask the child, what do you want for Christmas? The child will wonder, will I get everything that I've asked for? Parents ask, will all the kids make it home for Christmas? Will everybody get along if they do, right? We ask questions like, what are we going to have for Christmas dinner? Will I have enough money for all the gifts I need to buy? How much money should I spend this year? How am I going to handle all the stress, right? What's the best $5 gift I can get for a gift exchange? Uh, if I take this dumb gift back, will I get money or just store credit, you know? Or should I throw this away or just re-gift it? There's all kinds of questions that we ask at Christmas time. And did you know that there were questions surrounding the first Christmas? Zechariah, who was uh, the father of the one who would be the, the forerunner, the proclaimer, going ahead of the Messiah, Jesus, asked uh, his question, how can I be sure? Mary, when she was told that uh, her son would be uh, born and she, as a virgin, she asked, how can these things be? Uh, the wise men, just a couple of years later, as they come to find the Christ child, they ask the question in Scripture, you might remember it, where is he who is born king of the Jews? Christmas questions. Over the next few weeks, I'd like for us to dig into three important Christmas questions and answer them from Scripture. Questions, as we find the answer, can deepen our understanding and our celebration of Christmas. And the first Christmas question I believe it's important to ask is, why did Jesus come as a baby? Think of this picture. Why did Jesus come as a baby? When word got out that God was going to become a human, I can imagine the angel Gabriel was no doubt enthused. I mean, think about it. He can envision the moment, the Messiah coming in a blazing chariot, the king descending on a fiery cloud, an explosion of light from the Messiah which would emerge. Uh, what he never expected, however, was a slip of paper with a Nazarene address, God will become a baby, it read, tell the mother to name the child Jesus and tell her to not be afraid. The omnipotent in one moment made himself breakable. He who had been spirit became pierceable. He who was larger than the universe becomes an embryo. And he who sustains the world with the word chose to be dependent on the nourishment of a young girl. God as a baby, a baby who seemed at first glance like any other newborn child. He cried in the middle of the night. He hungered for milk. He needed fresh swaddling clothes every now and then. How could this infant be the Messiah? Or for that matter, why would the Son of God be an infant? Why would he come that way? Why didn't he come like, well, like one of these guys, like Thor, you know? He could have just smashed the devil with one swing. Or why didn't he come as an Iron Man with some celestial weaponized suit of armor to fight Satan? When the devil said, jump off this tape, uh, temple and the angels will catch you, no problem, Beelzebub. You're no match for me. Uh, and why didn't he come like this guy? By the way, that's the way I look first thing in the morning before I get my coffee. I just got that uh, look upon my face. Why not come as some earthly, heavenly mutant so when his enemies came to get him in the garden, he could say, okay, let's go do this. He could have burst through the clouds in all of his power and glory as the creator of the universe. He certainly had that ability. He could have arrived in the middle uh, of the night in his mighty majesty and challenged the current rulers of the earth. Tiberius and Herod would have been no match for him. Instead, he chose to come as a helpless infant in a, in a setting surrounded, well, it was better fit for animals than it was humans. Why? 
Why did he come as a baby? I think one answer to that question would simply be this. He came as a baby to trace him historically. Have you ever gone on to Ancestry.com and and you trace your roots back to a great-great-grandpa who was like a bootlegger or a gangster or something, and maybe you paid $100 to (laughs) discover your ancestry, and you might want to pay $500 to have it covered up, I don't know. But the point is, you didn't appear out of nowhere. There's a real traceable line that leads up to you. That's what happens in Matthew chapter 1 when you read the first chapter of the first book of the New Testament. Have you ever said, I'm going to read through the New Testament this year, and you start with Matthew chapter 1, and maybe if you're using the King James Version, it says, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and and -and so-and-so begat so-and-so. What's the word begat mean, you know? And it's the whole chapter. It's those who were born to him and those who were born to him all the way through the chapter. And you're thinking, you know, what's this all about? Why is that there? Well, here's the thing. Anyone claiming to be a Messiah had to be traced back through a certain genealogical line. That's why it's there. Specifically, they had to belong to the family of Abraham back in the book of Genesis and then traced also through the family, the lineage of David. So the first verse of the New Testament in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 says, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, and the son of Abraham. If you've ever read it, the rest of the chapter is a genealogy of Jewish history that leads right up to Jesus to show he was descended from Abraham and David, that he was qualified to be the Messiah. But it's more than that. It's to reveal that he's an actual historical figure. He wasn't a spirit, a phantom, a legend. He was real, touchable, historical human being. But here's the thing. You just don't get that from the Bible. You get that from sources outside of Scripture as well. Tacitus wrote in 112 AD. Here's what he wrote. He said, Christus, which means Christ, the founder of the name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate. Tacitus didn't have anything to do with the Bible. He was just a historian. Josephus, a historian uh, born in 37 AD, refers to Jesus as a wise man. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. There's an act expert by the name of Habermas who has compiled 22 ancient sources outside of Scripture that refer to a man called Jesus of Nazareth and 13 that specifically mention his resurrection outside of the Bible. This and and more led even someone like H.G. Wells, who was an atheist, to say this. One is obliged to say, here was a man, that part of the tale can't be avoided. It was a historical figure, Jesus Christ, who lived. He wasn't a comic book figure conceived in someone's imagination. He was a real touchable historical being. Here's a second reason why Jesus came as a baby, to fulfill Bible prophecy. You know, in the Old Testament, there were all kinds of promises, we call them prophecies, made about a Messiah who would come, a Savior. And they're made, you know, 1,500 years, 1,000 years, 750 years before Jesus came, and Jesus fulfilled each one. We talked a few weeks ago about what are the odds of that. Let me just go ahead and show a picture. The odds of winning the lottery are 1 in 259 million. The odds of a man fulfilling just eight of those prophecies written hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus came, Jesus fulfilled not only eight, but 300 of them. Uh, The odds of just eight is one in whatever that number is. Like I said, it's estimated that Jesus fulfilled about 300 prophecies in in his lifetime that were written hundreds of years before he came to earth, most of which he'd have no control over, that he'd be be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, that his legs on the cross would not be broken. How about the place of his birth? Micah chapter 5, verse 2, written by a prophet named Micah, 750 years before Jesus is born. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, I want you to remember, he gives two names to the city. I'm going to come back to that. Though you're small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Maybe you'll remember when the wise men were seeking the newborn king. They come to Herod in Matthew chapter 2 and say, where is he that is born? And, And Herod wants to find out, not so he can worship him, but he wants to put Jesus to death. He thinks Jesus is going to be a threat to his throne. So he calls in the the chief scribes and the Jewish authorities, and they say, where is it? And they quote Micah in Matthew chapter 2 in the Christmas story. They quote this verse of Scripture, and here's what they say in Matthew chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. In Bethlehem, Judea, for this is what the prophet has written. And then they go ahead and they quote in the next verse, Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. So Jesus being born as a baby 
fulfilled biblical prophecy concerning the Messiah spoken 750 years before his birth. And check it out. What did we say Micah called Bethlehem? He gave it two names. Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Now I want you to think about what those two names mean. All right? Bethlehem means house of bread. Ephrathah means fruitfulness or fruit fields. Why did Micah quote both names? Why not just refer to Bethlehem? Now watch this. Bethlehem, like I said, refers to bread. Ephrathah means fruit fields, refers also to the fruit of the vine, of the grape juice. Even to this day, Bethlehem's a a place of fruitful vineyards. So I want to say this slowly and clearly, and I want you to think about it carefully. If Bethlehem refers to bread, and Ephrathah, Ephrathah refers to the wine or the fruit of the vine, what's that get you thinking about? The bread? and the Jews. God came to this city to remind us that his body would be the bread of life and his blood would be the fruit of the vine of salvation. So every Sunday when we open up these containers and we take that piece of bread and we hold that juice in our hand, every time we take this bread and drink from this cup, we remember Bethlehem. Don't take this time lightly. Every time we partake of communion, we're reminded that Jesus was a baby born to us so he could die for us. God knows what he's about. Even down to the names of the city where Jesus was born, God had it all planned out so even a little town would always point back not only to the birth of Jesus, but to the body and blood of Jesus there at the cross. Now, I know we've heard that a hundred times, in fact, about the Christmas story and his cross, but God was in control, bring it all to that place. Now, think about all the things that happened in those hundreds of years before Jesus came. An enemy came in and conquered the Jewish people, carried a lot of them away to captivity. There's all kinds of things going on, destruction of the city. It's a mess. But then God somehow, through all that mess, brings it right down to where he said it would be. Luke chapter 2, verse 11 in the Christmas story. Today in the town of David, the town of David is Bethlehem. A Savior's been born to you. He's Christ, Messiah, the Lord. Now, here's the thing. If God pulled that off then, don't you think he can get you through what you're facing now? If Jesus' plan for you was this big, do you really think you have any problem that's too big for him now? God promises in his word the righteous will not be forsaken. God works all things together for good. For those who love him, he's going to supply all your needs in Christ Jesus. Trust in him fully. He'll direct your paths. He answers prayer. He forgives sin when you come to the cross. He gets his people through. You can take it to the bank. If he kept his word then, he'll keep his promise to his people now. Here's the third reason. Jesus came as a baby to humbly identify with humanity. When my boys were little, I used to play football with them in our basement in our house. Would I stand on my feet and run as fast as I could, plowing them into the wall every time it was my turn to have the ball? No, right? Like a lot of you dads, I got down on my knees, on their level, eye to eye, shoulder to shoulder, and then I would plow them into the wall. No, I'm just kidding there. But I, I, do, I do know of a dad, though, who actually, when he was playing with his five, six, seven-year-old girls playing basketball, he would swat away every shot they took. And I asked him why. It's a true story. And he said, because they're going to have to earn it if they're ever going to score against me. Now, if you're a child, which dad would you rather relate to? The one who gets down on your level or the dad who's just going to swat away your every effort? The Bible says this about Jesus in Philippians chapter 2, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. But then it goes on to say he made himself nothing. He took the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled, humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He humbled himself. Think about that. Relying on someone else to wipe your nose and change your diapers is a pretty humble place to be for the Messiah. And he put himself in the place of humility throughout his entire life. He was the son of a middle-class family, became a carpenter, made friends with the outcasts of society, let people murder him on a cross for our sake. He humbled himself. He had to. No one else could humble him. See, here's the thing. You don't humble God. You humble man. But you don't humble God. I've been humbled a lot of times in my life. My parents humbled me. My teachers humbled me. My coaches humbled me. My wife humbles me every once in a while. I mean, that's your job, isn't it, ladies? Right? It's like the husband who was looking in the mirror and asked his wife, 
How many devastatingly handsome men do you think there are in the world? And she said, one less than you think. You know, it's your job, isn't it, ladies, to sort of humble us a little bit here. You can get humbled in this world, but you don't humble God. Nobody humbles God. And yet Paul writes, Jesus willingly humbled himself all the way down to being obedient to death. Look at John chapter 1, verse 14. The word Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us, not above us, not apart from us, but among us. How could we follow his footsteps as a man if we hadn't seen him crawl as a child? How could we believe he had undergone all the temptation we faced if he had bypassed the most difficult years in which we struggle to earn our adulthood? To make the full sacrifice on our behalf, Jesus had to make the full commitment. It would have meant very little to us if he had just sprung from heaven in all of his heavenly glory and say, okay, go ahead, put my hands and feet on the cross here. I got to get back. Instead, we see him as a child in a manger. We see him at the temple as a boy on the verge of maturity, already about his father's business. We see his mom and dad wandering about him when they witness in Luke chapter 2 and verse 52 that he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. And finally, we see him as a young man quietly beginning his ministry that would change all of human history. We overhear the whispers from his neighbors as they would watch him. And here's what they would say. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And all of his brothers listed there. By the way, that's not the Judas that betrays him. That's a different Judas. Aren't all his sisters with us? We see him in the desert wrestling with temptation and the matter of his destiny as we know he's fully human. And we see his love for children. He bounces them on his knee and we can believe it because he too's been a child. And then those crude spikes that are drilled into his hands and his feet as he dies on a cross for our sins. Matthew chapter 1 verse 23. Emmanuel, which means God with us. Emmanuel, divinity. in the body of humanity with us. If it had only been God, his sacrifice would have been cheap and unconvincing, don't you think? If he had been man only, his sacrifice wouldn't have had any power, but he's both God and man. Here's the point. God himself felt what we feel in the incarnation. He didn't stay apart from us. He came among us. He got down at eye level, down on his knees, basically. God experienced what it's like to be tired and discouraged and exhausted. He bled. He hurt. He even prayed a psalm on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Maybe in your pain you're tempted to say, God, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know how I feel. And he says, you know what? Oh, what you're going through, me too. I've been there. I got down on my knees. I entered your world. I know how you feel. I've been, I am with you now. I care. I can help. He knows what it's like to lose a loved one, John. He knows what it's like to weep at a funeral, his friend Lazarus. He knows what it's like to be exhausted, to be betrayed by a friend, Judas, to feel all alone. The disciples deserted him. He knows how it feels. That's what Bethlehem's birth is all about. I like the way Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 puts it in the J.B. Phillips version. We don't have a superhuman high priest to whom our weaknesses are unintelligible. It's talking about Jesus. It says, he himself shared fully in our experience, shared fully in all our experience. He himself, not an angel, not a representative, but he himself shared fully, not partially, not nearly, in all our experience, every hurt, every ache, all the stresses and strains. It's like he doesn't want us to miss it, so he states it with double clarity. He shared fully in all our experiences. Think about that. I think the first thing we might say when we get to heaven is, Jesus, you left all this for that down there? Think of all the beauty and wonder and grandeur of glory that he's surrounded with. And he comes to earth and his first sensation he knows as he leaves the womb is discomfort. He's cold. He's hungry. The first smell in his nostrils is stench. He's born in a dirty manger for crying out loud. I wonder if he ever had a time growing up when he didn't close the door behind himself and Mary yelled, close the door, were you born in a barn? And he could say, as a matter of fact, I was. In heaven, Jesus had known legions of angels hovering around the throne, tens of thousands of them assigned to full-time job of declaring, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, worthy is the Lamb. And he comes down to earth, and there's straw and animals and animal stuff and stinky shepherds just standing around him. I remember back when I was in college, and I got to travel one summer with a singing group that represented the school. And so when people would host us in their homes in different cities and different places, they would put on their best for us. 
like you do for a guest. And so we got to swim in their pools. We got to take uh, time at the beaches of Florida. And one night I was fed fresh crab meat until I was stuffed. But one evening we traveled to upstate New York and we're in the middle of nowhere. And we got lost and we didn't get to the church building until 2 o'clock a.m. Sunday morning. And the preacher was a little upset about that. But there's different families assigned. You say, you go with them, you go with them, you're spending the night here, you're spending the night there. And so they're divvying up everybody. And my buddy Dave and I, the guy looked at us and he said, you two are staying with him. And I looked over and I saw this poor guy with a patch over one eye. He had crazy hair sticking all over the place. And he had this look of a mad professor about him. And he, 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 we got in his car and he took us 30 minutes out into some remote location. And we got out of the car and we headed for the house. And he said, oh, no, boys, you're not staying in here. You're, he pointed to this rusty old trailer he had out on the edge of the woods. And he said, you're staying out there tonight. It was like some scene out of the horror film, The Blair Witch Project or something, you know. And we finally get settled in, eyes as big as saucers, praying the children's prayer. If I should die before I wake, that kind of thing. You, know? you think I'm sleeping, 3 o'clock in the morning, out in the middle. I want, where's home? I want to go back home. You know? I had a pity party for myself, and Dave did too. You know? We become accustomed to a way of living, to a way of traveling, to a certain set of accommodations. It's uncomfortable for us to take a step down and comfort our expectation because we've only known earth. We probably don't reflect much on what it meant for Jesus to leave heaven to come to earth. Jesus just didn't take one step down. Jesus took four and came from heaven to earth. That Philippians chapter 2 passage says he came to earth and he became a man, not a superhero, a man. Not just a man, he became a servant. He served us. And not just a servant, he became one who was condemned like a common criminal on a cross to give his life for your sin and for mine. That was Jesus. He willingly humbled himself. He went from commanding angels to sleeping in straw, from, from, from holding stars to clutching Mary's finger for you and for me. Here's the fourth reason he came as a baby. He came as a baby to illustrate his approachability. In other words, to show to us he's accessible. You felt comfortable in Jesus' presence when he was here. Uh, show that picture again of Iron Man. Look at, do you think the woman at the well would have felt at ease pouring her heart out to this guy? Do you think the woman in Mark chapter 5, with the sickness, the illness, she busts through the crowd to touch his garment? Do you think she would have busted through the crowd to touch this guy's iron garment? But who's afraid of a baby? Everybody loves a baby. Everybody, oh, the baby, let me hold the baby. Oh, look at him, right? There he is, big boy, right? There's something about a baby that just draws us in. And there was something about Jesus, his birth, his life, his sacrificial death that draws us in too. In fact, Jesus would say later in John chapter 12 and verse 32, he's talking about the cross. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all people to myself. That's the way it was with Jesus. All kinds of people were attracted to him. Sinners like the thief on the cross, intellectuals like Nicodemus, doubters like Thomas. All kinds of people were comfortable in his presence. There's not a hint of one person who's basically afraid to, to draw near him. There were those who mocked him, those who were envious of him, those who misunderstood him, those who revered him. But there's, you know, it's hard to find a person who's reluctant and, 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 and just to, to approach him feeling that, that get rejected. The Bible says in Mark chapter 12 and verse 37, the common people heard him gladly. Think about it. He fed the hunger of the crowd. He felt the limp of the lame. He healed the hurt of the diseased. He embraced the loneliness of the leper. He forgave the sin of the fallen. He calmed the storms like a God. He cried like a friend. He healed like a doctor. He spoke like an order. He loved like a savior. He was powerful enough to feed a crowd of 5,000 with just a few loaves and fish, yet he's personal enough to take that baby and bounce it on his lap or to share a meal with your family around a table remember the story in matthew chapter 8 verse 2 where a leper it says a leper a man with leprosy came and knelt before jesus and said lord if you're willing you can make me clean now a leper wasn't supposed to be around people back then and they were just call out unclean and the crowds would part no one would touch a leper he couldn't even be with his family but evidently there was something in this guy's mind that said, no, I can't go to the temple, I can't go to the market, I can't even go home, but I can go to Jesus. And remember what Jesus did in verse 3? Verse 3 says, and Jesus reached out his hand and he touched him. I am willing, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Now, did Jesus have to touch him to heal him? There were times Jesus healed with a command. There was times Jesus healed at a distance. Go home, your servant is made well. But Jesus touches him. 
He puts his hand on the one being healed. Why in the world would he do that? Maybe the touch was not just for the sick man. Maybe it was for all of us who are sick with sin. Maybe it was to say it's not who you are. Your value was found in whose you are. That regardless of who we are or what others think about us, we have value simply because we're created by a God who loves us more than we could ever imagine. And if a dirty leper could approach Jesus and find compassion and hope, then any down and out sinner like you and me can too. Here's the fifth reason. Jesus came as a baby to foreshadow what happens to us spiritually. I love this. Think about being present at a new birth. Isn't that awesome when you're there in the hospital? I remember when Ashley was born, our firstborn, and going to the hospital. We got there at 6 o'clock in the morning, and she wasn't born until after dark that night. And the grandparents were in the waiting room, and I burst through, barely holding back the tears. It's a girl. And then fast forward 26 years later, it's my turn in the waiting room now with all the expectant grandparents. And we knew Kenson, our first grandchild, had been born. But uh, Ashley had had a C-section, and it was taking some time. Of course, she was holding him. Her and Kyle was bonding with the little one. And uh, everybody was getting antsy, though. And while everybody's attention was turned, I walked down through the double doors at the hospital, down the hall, and I met Kyle coming out of the room. He said, it's okay. You guys can come in now. Well, at that point, I had a decision to make. Do I go back and tell the crowd and get run over in the onslaught here at the Stampede, or do I go in by myself and see God's gift of life? Well, you know which one I chose. I went in and Ashley said, you want to hold him, Dad? And if you've ever been there, you know, does, does a hungry man want food? Does a poor person want a $5? Yes, yes. And so I held him, and it was a, such a precious moment. I stood there in silence. If you've ever been there, you know what it's like. It was wonderful. Until 20 seconds later, Sherry burst through the door and jerked him right out of my arms, I tell you. But there's something about a new birth that's unlike anything else. There's joy, and there's celebration, and there's tears, and there's hope, and it's wonderful. Can you think of a better way for God to give the gift of salvation to you and me? Can you? Jesus being born physically as a baby would foreshadow what happens when we accept him into our lives and are born anew spiritually. Jesus himself would say in John chapter 3, he said this, I I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. And then he goes on to say in verse 5, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and spirit. He's talking about one birth there. For you're buried with Christ, Colossians chapter 2 verse 12 says, when you're baptized and with him you're raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead, new life. You ever witnessed someone coming to the Lord? What emotions did you experience? There was joy and there was celebration. There were tears. There was hope. What happens at the birth of a baby is, in essence, what happens when someone comes to faith and is baptized into Christ. Only you're not celebrating just a life. You're celebrating eternal life, new life. He was born as a baby to say to you and me, you want hope? You want joy? You can be born again. The angels are just waiting to burst through every door of heaven with the news. A dad uh, tells a story about his son, Nicholas. It was at his school. And he went to his son's school during the day to be part of the Christmas play rehearsal because he wasn't going to be able to be there that night. And the teacher had planned for the dress rehearsal that parents who had to work that night could come in. So there was a number of parents in there. He went in and he sat down and all the kids filed in And they sat cross-legged on the floor, the kids did. And each group, one by one, rose to perform their song. A group of first to sixth graders, whatever it was. The public school system, you know, had long ago stopped referring to holiday as Christmas. And so he had expected the songs about reindeers and snowflakes and good cheer and that kind of stuff. But he was sort of surprised when his son's class rose to share what was called Christmas love. He said, Nicholas, my son, was all aglow with all of his classmates, and they were all donned in their winter apparel. And each one would take center stage, there was a number of them, and they'd hold up a letter that would spell out Christmas love. C is for Christmas, next child H is for happy, on down the line until each child holding up his portion had presented the complete message, Christmas love. 
The performance was going smoothly until somebody uh, noticed that the little girl, and the rest of them noticed it too, <laughs> that the little girl in the front row holding up the M held it upside down, and it was a W. But she didn't know she was wrong. She was holding it proudly, and people began to snicker and laugh. And, and uh, although many teachers tried to quiet the children, the laughter continued until the last letter was raised. But then they all saw it together. A hush came over the audience, and eyes began to widen. In that instant, they understood the reason they were there, why they celebrated the holiday in the first place, he said, why even in the chaos there was a purpose for the festivities. For when the last letter was held high, the message read loud and clear, not Christmas love, but with that upside-down M becoming a W, Christ was love. And he still is. For when that baby was born, hanging over the nativity was the shadow of Calvary. There was an infant's crib because there had to become an Emmanuel's cross. And just as the angel said, You'll call his name Jesus, for he'll save the people from their sins. And he's still doing that today. Won't you let him do that for you? Let's pray.